Let's have another word of prayer. Lord, Father, I just ask and pray, Lord, that the words that I share, that they be your words and not mine, Lord, that this message, Lord, will be for your glory, your praise, and your honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been angry at somebody or something and wanted to react? Maybe someone does something dishonest or unjust and you feel like setting them straight or maybe even taking revenge. A man in England who hadn't been paid the 600 euros for work he'd done was so upset that he took a backhoe and drove it into the foyer of a hotel in Liverpool and went on a rampage, causing massive damage. But here's the thing. He actually had been paid. There was a glitch in the bank and the money was transferred to his account late. Matter of fact, the money was transferred into his account as he was engaged in the rampage and demolishing the foyer. You know, the story of Jonah is one of the greatest stories in the Bible. If you are not a Christian, if you are not a believer, you look at that story as being a fable or a fairy tale, but for those of us who are believers, know that it is one of the greatest stories in the Bible. Jonah ran away from God's calling. He was swallowed by a sea creature and then belched up three days later. Jonah then warned the Ninevites of impending judgment and incredibly, the wicked Ninevites actually repented. But Jonah wasn't happy about their conversion. In fact, he was angry that they came to faith in God and were spared divine judgment. The Bible tells us that Jonah was displeased exceedingly and very angry. Think about that for a minute. He was angry that God chose not to destroy a city full of people. The Ninevites repented, God spared them, and Jonah was angry. Angry over his reputation. A psychologist in Maryland recently published an article that said uncontrolled anger has become our number one mental health issue. A lot of crime is committed in anger. We often refer to them as crimes of passion. Everyone heard that term before? Crimes of passion. One example that occurs probably more often than it should is road rage. Seems like we have more and more people engage in acts of road rage. I don't know what it is about getting behind a steering wheel, but people aren't that angry when they're just sitting at home or in their workplace, but the minute you put them in a car and something, somebody does something wrong, they become really angry, right? Each one of us can think of things that we've either witnessed or even maybe done ourselves as a result of anger. But is all anger bad? Or is there actually such a thing as good anger? And that's what we're going to explore today. Most scientists will tell you that there are six distinct human emotions. There's happiness, right? We've all felt happy. There's sadness, another uh, emotion we've all experienced. Fear, we've all been afraid of something at some point in our time. Surprise disgust when we don't like something, right? Often in the forms of something we may put in our mouths and taste and we say this isn't good, right? We're disgusted by it. And then there's anger, right? Six distinct human emotions that God created. Therefore, God gave us the ability to experience anger when he created us, right? It's one of the six major emotions. When it is rightly used, Anger actually protects us from the abuse of others, and it motivates us to intervene when we see others being harmed. Without the ability to experience anger, we would be like a cat that can sleep on the couch while a man beats up his wife and kids. How many of you grew up believing that anger was a bad emotion or something to avoid? Right? Many of us probably believe that. Maybe you still do believe that. Over the years, I've actually begun to see that there are two kinds of anger, and knowing the difference is important in our spiritual journeys. 
Anger is an emotion that God built into us when he created us in his image, right? Therefore, it's okay to be angry so long as it's for the right reason and it's handled the right way. Let me repeat that. For the right reason and handled the right way. Some of you may be asking yourselves, well, what is a good reason to be angry? Well, thankfully, in God's Word, we see both kinds of anger, and we see the parameters that God sets for each one. But before we get into Scripture, I want to give you a real-life example of an incident that happened in Philadelphia in October of 2021. A woman was riding on the Metro, along with 17 other passengers, and a man sat next to her and began to touch her and remove her clothes and eventually uh, sexually assaulted her. The assault lasted for eight minutes and no one did anything. No one intervened, no one called 911. A couple of people took out cell phones and took video of it, but it lasted eight minutes. There was no righteous anger on that Metro car. Just 19 people who were glad it wasn't happening to them. Our scripture reading today from Ephesians 4.26 says, In your anger, do not sin. It's obvious that there is such a thing as righteous anger as well as sinful anger. And today we're going to look at both types. Sinful anger centers on yourself. It typically results when we feel hurt or disappointed or betrayed or rejected. Any perceived injustice can result in sinful anger, even if the injustice isn't real. When we take offense, anger usually isn't far behind. Injustice can also result in sinful anger if it isn't processed properly. Sinful anger can leave us exasperated and frustrated in the circumstances. It produces cynicism and distrust. We may even claim, I have a right to be angry. And that may be true. Perhaps you were treated unfairly. But the question is this, is your anger righteous? You see, sinful anger alienates us from God and from those around us. It's characterized by self-focus, focusing on yourself. And one of the many harmful side effects of this type of anger is that it erodes our desire to pray as we fume and eventually boil over. There have probably been times in your life when you've gotten angrier over a minor inconvenience than a legitimate injustice. At times we get angrier over our damaged pride than we do over the marring of God's character. Perhaps we become self-righteously angry like the older brother in Jesus' story of the prodigal son over his father's special treatment over his irresponsible brother, right? The older brother was self-righteously angry because it was, look at me, look what I did, look what I deserve, and yet he got this. Self-righteous anger. Or maybe we're selfishly angry like Jonah over the demise of a plant while not caring about 120,000 sinners who came to repentance. You see, Jonah was angry because as a prophet, he feared that if God didn't destroy the Ninevites, he would lose all credibility, right? He was selfish over his reputation. Selfish anger. There's a good reason to heed Paul's admonition to avoid sinful anger. We have a very real enemy, Satan who loves to take advantage of unresolved anger to cause us to engage in slander, gossip, strife, disunity, bitterness, and even physical violence. Satan knows that we often forget that anger leads to a variety of sin. On the other hand, righteous anger will actually move us to godly action, like intervening on the subway when someone is being assaulted. Righteous anger will always move us toward prayer, unlike sinful anger, which will cause us to avoid prayer. Righteous anger is a deep displeasure over the way evil defames God and hurts other people. Over time, righteous anger will bear redemptive fruit 
as it guides us towards movements of faith and love and true justice. Godly anger is not rude, it is not arrogance or dishonoring. Remember what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, which is known as the love chapter. Love suffers long in its kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. And thinks no evil. I know what some of you are thinking. Didn't Paul tell us that none of us are righteous, including our deeds? Yes, Paul did say that. But I'm not referring to righteousness in terms of sinless perfection. Righteous anger is simply being angry at what makes God angry. If God gets angry when a child is molested, then you should be angry as well, but in a calm and composed manner. When it comes to anger, the righteous part should always come first because God's anger is a byproduct of His righteousness. When our anger is righteous, we will be angry over the evil that perverts God's goodness and holiness. Let me give you an example from Scripture to support what I've been saying so far. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32, we're going to start in verse 7. Exodus 32, verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, Go get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Does that sound like God was angry? This is a perfect example of God's righteous anger. Let's go down now to verse 19. We're still in chapter 32, verse 19. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made, burned it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and he scattered it on the water, and he made the children of Israel drink it. Does that sound like Moses was angry? Moses joined God in anger to bring about correction and repentance among his people. If we don't experience righteous anger over sin and genuine injustice, we'll become complacent and apathetic about it, which results in no action and mere tolerance. I would argue that a lack of righteous anger is what is allowing evil to flourish in society today. All you have to do is turn on the news at any given part of the day and watch news from any major city in this country, and you will see that every type of crime is on the rise, from property crime to carjackings to burglaries. You've all seen the flash mob, right? People running in stores and running out with thousands and thousands of dollars of merchandise. Just happened two days ago, not far from where my parents live in Glendale. I think they got $900,000 out of their clothing store. They said there were over 20 people involved, and no one really seems to care. The people in charge blame everybody other than the criminals. If God's people don't take a stand, who will? Therefore, righteous anger should always move us to biblical action. Here's another example, probably the most famous example in Scripture. Turn with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 13 through 16. Now the past 
Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. It's important to note that Jesus never whipped anyone, and he did not harm a single person. The purpose of his anger was to restore holiness in the temple and to get sinners to turn and repent from their conduct. Jesus' desire was not to harm, but to draw attention to the wickedness taking place in the temple. Righteous anger is always under emotional control. It is never out of control. If you see somebody who's out of control, then you could assume it is not righteous indignation. Even at the cross, Jesus maintained control over his emotions. 1 Peter 2.23 tells us that when he was reviled, Jesus did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus, the maker of humanity, the savior of the world, was more than rejected. Wicked men plotted to end his life. His motives were misrepresented. The authorities watched him, and they sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his every word in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. If anyone had reason to lash out, it certainly was Jesus. But under intense provocation, he didn't react negatively. He remained calm, kind, and gracious. It has always struck me as, re as remarkable that after having been abandoned by his friends, betrayed by a disciple, and convicted by a kangaroo court, after having been beaten and spit upon and hearing crowds howl for his blood, after not having eaten for almost a day, and after having stayed up all night long, Jesus still didn't react in anger. As Christ followers, we should return blessing for cursing and love for malice. But we should also have a righteous anger over things such as child abuse and human trafficking and racism and public corruption and violent crime. If something angers God, we should be angered by it as well, just like Moses was coming down Mount Sinai. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture is Proverbs 28.1. Proverbs 28.1 says, Proverbs 28.1, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. This scripture is actually placed on the National Law Enforcement Memorial in Washington, D.C. to recognize all the uh, fallen officers who have sacrificed their life in pursuit of the wicked. Because when no one pursues the wicked, what does scripture tell us? They flee, which means they, they get more emboldened to do the things that they're doing because no one is pursuing them. Most, many police officers will tell you the reason why they went into that profession is because either they or someone in their family is a victim of a crime, and they got into that profession to make a difference. Somebody has to get angry at the things that are going on in the world. So how do we go about being angry in an appropriate way, right? Well, we will never be perfectly angry while we're on this imperfect planet but there are things that we can do. We must first identify any sin that exists in our lives and repent of it, right? Because oftentimes, because of our uncontrolled anger, we commit sin. We must first clean that up from our lives. Then what we should do is commit this passage to memory in James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. James 
one nineteen through twenty says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Right? The wrath of man, meaning within our flesh, we need to be angry at the things that God is angry about in an appropriate way. Because when we follow this biblical principle, righteous fruit will be the result. But anger that is inappropriately expressed will lead to vengeance and other unhealthy actions. Our anger should always lead us to take redemptive action, as Jesus' anger did in the temple. Don't become angry at things that don't anger God, and don't ever become vengeful. Your anger and actions should produce positive results, such as ending abuse or putting to stop an injustice. Ask God for a heart that enables you to be angry only at the things that anger Him. We cannot claim our anger is righteous if everything about it doesn't line up with God's word and character. And we certainly cannot justify it if it ever causes us to sin. We must always ask ourselves, do I want to be right or do I want to be righteous? No matter how reprehensible the circumstances, we are not, never ever justified in sinning by our responses. The heart of God should always be the reason for the anger that we experience and express in our lives. I heard a story about a woman who was a victim of a human trafficking ring. She was uh, an immigrant, so she paid uh, what they call coyotes to bring her into the United States and of course the coyotes then sold her into a human trafficking ring where she was victimized for several years. Naturally, she was angry at those who perpetrated the crime and wanted vengeance. But instead of allowing her anger to repay evil for evil, she used her anger for redemptive action. She eventually formed a nonprofit organization where she raised awareness and money for victims and helped rescue other victims from human trafficking rings. Anger will always drive us into action. It always will. It's one of the six emotions that God gave us, right? God wouldn't have given us an emotion that he didn't want us to have. If God only wanted us to have one emotion, he could have just made us to be robots, right? Don't robots basically have one emotion? But the fact that we have different emotions is because God wants us to experience joy and happiness and sadness and surprise and disgust and even anger. But our anger should always drive us into action for good. If you don't get angry when an injustice is occurring, then you're like the cat sleeping on the couch or the metro riders in Philadelphia. As our scripture reading said, be angry, but do not sin. Use your anger to bring about positive change in this world, positive change in your community, positive change in our church, so that Jesus Christ is glorified in his character. At this time, let us stand 